President Gorib Fakim, Ambassador Suraj Fukir, members of the President's delegation, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed, good morning. My name is Monde Muyangwa, and I'm the director of the Africa program. And on behalf of Congresswoman Harmon, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, and the rest of the Wilson Center team, it is my great pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Amina Gureb Fakim, President of the Republic of Mauritius, to the Wilson Center. We're absolutely delighted and honored to have you here with us today. I would also like to take a moment to welcome those of you joining us on Twitter. You can participate in this conversation by using the hashtag at Innovate Leadership, all one word. And if you have any questions during the Q&A, please feel free to tweet them to at WPS Project. This is a sad and difficult day for our country as we woke up to the horrific news of the mass shooting in Las Vegas last night. And before we begin, I would like to offer our prayers and condolences for all of those who, were, who lost their lives and those who were injured in the shooting last night. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families, friends, and loved ones. As you may know, the Wilson Center was established in 1968 by an act of Congress as a, leaving, as a living memorial to the ideals of President Wilson, the only US president to hold a PhD. Today, the Wilson Center works to provide a nonpartisan space where the worlds of policy and scholarship intersect through public events and research to address and offer options for resolving current and emerging challenges confronting the United States and the rest of the world. Among the more than 14 programs comprising the Wilson Center are the Africa Program and the Women in Public Service Project. And today, the two programs join hands to host President Gareb Fakim. The Wilson Center follows events on the ground in Africa very closely and strives to address key issues impacting Africa and the United States. Similarly, the Women in Public Service Project, led by my colleague Gwen Young, works to accelerate global progress towards women equal women's equal participation in policy and political leadership in order to create more dynamic and inclusive institutions that leverage the full potential of the world's population to change the way global solutions are forged. As our two programs work on our respective missions, we work hard to bring African voices and perspectives, those of scholars, practitioners, as well as leaders from the public and private spheres to bear on these issues. And over the past few years, we have hosted the presidents of Malawi, Tanzania, Burkina Faso, Burundi, Somalia, and Madagascar, to name just a few. And so we are delighted to add Her Excellency Amina Garib Fakim to this illustrious list. Let me now introduce the president to give her address, after which I will turn over the proceedings to my colleague Gwen Young, director of the Women in Public Service Project, to moderate the discussion with the president. President Garib Fakim was sworn in as Mauritius' sixth president and its first female president in June 2015. She is also the fourth woman president in Africa. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Surrey and a, BH, a PhD from the University of Exeter. Prior to becoming president, she was the managing director of the International Center for Pharmaceutical Development Research and Innovation and was also the professor of organic chemistry with an endowed chair at the University of Mauritius. Between 2001 and 2010, she served successively as the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Mauritius. She's a founding member of the Pan-African Association of African Medicinal Plants and co-authored the first ever African herbal pharmacopoeia. She has also authored, she has also a book, authored the book of medicinal plants at State House, which I understand um, she wrote 
after she became president, and I was honored to receive a copy of that book this morning, and I was just telling the president how grateful I am for what she has done in that area. I grew up in Zambia. I remember going to visit my grandmother in the village and going with her out into the forest as she pointed out the different medicinal plants. And unfortunately, uh, my grandmother, who could not read or write, died before we could commit any of that to paper. And so I am so grateful that the president has put this to pen and paper and actually captured something that is so important to the African continent. So thank you, Madam President. Absolutely. She is an accomplished author, having authored or co-authored over 28 books and several book chapters and scientific articles in the fields of biodiversity, conservation, and sustainable development. She has received numerous awards and fellowships, including as a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London, fellow of the Islamic Academy of Science, and fellow of the African Science Institute, and was a recipient of the African Union's Commission Award for Women in Science. She currently serves on the African Union's Presidential Committee on Science and Technology, and as the Vice Chair and Trustee of Planet Earth Institute, an international NGO focused on science and technology and Africa's scientific independence. Since taking office, she has promoted partnerships for increased funding and expanded research and innovation in Mauritius and in Africa more broadly. Finally, in introducing the president, I think it's important to mention that she leads a country that for 10 consecutive years has been ranked first in Africa for good governance. And this is according to the Moore Ibrahim Index of African Governance. And we appreciate that she continues to build on that success and the shining light and example that Mauritius continues to provide to many countries in Africa and globally. We have asked the president to speak to us about the progress, challenges, and opportunities for cross-sector innovations towards gender parity in leadership in Africa and globally. And as you can tell from the brief sketch, sketch of her bio, President Gurub Fakim is uniquely placed to speak to this issue. We're excited to hear from her on this topic, and it is now my honor and privilege to invite the President to the podium. Madam President, the mic is yours. Thank you. Dr. Monde Mnyangwa, Director, Africa Program. Ms. Gwen Young, Director, Global Women's Leadership Initiative. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Before I start the speech, I would like uh, again to cast a special thought to those who have lost loved one last night in Vegas in this terrible attack. So I rec I join you, Gwen, um, Gwen, and of course, Monday, in your special thought this morning. It is a pleasure to be here today and to speak at the Wilson Center as part of the Distinguished Women in Public Service project of the Global Women's Leadership Initiative. I would like to thank Ms. Gwen Young for the kind invitation to speak and appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts on the critical importance of science technology, engineering, mathematics, the famous STEM programs, with an emphasis on inclusion of women and girls. Ladies and gentlemen, in September 2015, the UN General Assembly declared February 11th as the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, coinciding with adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, also known as Agenda 2030. The SDGs are built on a strong foundation of science, technology, innovation, the STI, with a consistent call for gender equality throughout. The standalone goal on gender equality is bold and clear and will serve as a guidepost in our collective efforts to achieve gender equality in all spheres of human activity and advancement. The SDGs are an important opportunity to commit to a new mindset, one that disrupts inertia, questions the status quo, and discards 
old prejudices while introducing new ideas that are big, creative, achievable, and sustainable. The global education gender gap has been impressive, has seen impressive declines around the world. In sub-Saharan Africa, between 2004 and 2014, 94% of the education gender gap was closed. In my country, Mauritius, a big catalyst for progress was triggered when free education became to be provided in 1976. Notwithstanding this impressive gain, a 2016 UNESCO report provides new evidence that gender gaps in education persist. Some 16 million girls worldwide between ages 6 and 11 will never start school, compared to 8 million boys. The gap widens when one moves beyond education to factor in future employment and wage earnings. In fact, the World Economic Forum finds that Sub-Saharan Africa was still at only 68% gender parity as at 2016. Yet, several opportunities for women and girls to advocate for their interests, rights, and social transformations are opening up, particularly through information and communication technology. In colleges, women are catching up in science and maths, and businesses are realizing that a more diverse, gender-balanced workforce adds shareholder value and contributes to achieving the bottom line. In fact, at the extreme of the education scale, the World Economic Report reports that as of last year, my country of Mauritius ranked highest among 142 countries in the women to men ratio of students enrolled in PhD program with 1.32 women to every man. Now you can. <laughs> well, on a United note, you can try to find out what this 0.32 means. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, science, technology, and innovation have the power to disrupt and shift trajectories as STI increasingly influences all aspects of life today, not just careers directly in the sciences. STI solutions are required to grow business and social enterprise, improve health outcomes, including sexual and reproductive health, provide clean water and energy, manage the environment, and develop infrastructure. The SDG Gender Goal directs the global community to enhance the use of enabling technology, in particular information and communication technology to promote the empowerment of women. The ability of women to access, <coughs> benefit from, develop influence, and lead these sectors will directly impact whether we achieve Planet 5050 goal to make national commitments to address the challenges that are holding women and girls back from reaching their full potential by 2030. Moreover, as history shows, science serves as the basis for informed decision making and effective impact assessment in all sectors. Of course, having women in leadership positions in science, business, and public office is a powerful signal for both men and women. Just think of the iconic role that Marie Curie played more than 100 years ago after winning her two Nobel Prizes. And it was certainly heartening to see that the thick glass ceiling of, the, of that ultimate male bastion, the Marine Corps, has just been broken with a female Marine graduating from the grueling infantry office co officer course, the first among 36 pioneering women who have tried to accomplish this milestone since 2012. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if women are left out of full participation in 21st century aspirations, we will not achieve gender equality nor realize our broader goals for growth, prosperity, and well-being, including scientific advancement. We simply cannot afford to draw from anything other than 100% of our talent pool if we are serious about transforming African economies into sustainable enterprises driven by innovation. I firmly believe that no team can even contemplate or win by leaving 52% of the team on the bench. We need more women who can raise awareness and lead by example. I'm looking to the present generation to carry forward this torch. 
Unfortunately, in Africa, as in the developed world, the number of women in STEM declined steadily on the arc from secondary school to university laboratories, teaching, policy making, decision making, and leadership. There are great divides in women access to participation in and leadership within STI sectors, despite being on the front lines of energy use, climate change adaptation, economic production, and as stewards of extensive traditional knowledge. In the formal STI sector worldwide, women make up just under 10% of those in innovation hubs and funding by venture capitalists, and only 5% of membership in national academies in science and technology disciplines. We are similarly underrepresented in research and development, publishing leadership in government and the private sector, and the list goes on. We must address urgently the disconnect between the interest and ability of women to provide brain power and their inclusion in the formal power structure of science and scientific policy making. The reasons for this disconnect are many, ranging from access to technology, to education, investment gaps, to unsupporting work environment, to cultural beliefs and customs around childcare and persistent stereotypes. Globally, girls demonstrate no less interest in science and math education in primary schools than do boys, then start to select themselves out of STEM courses in the early secondary school. Societal attitudes and bias hinder girls' self-confidence and ambition, with science and technology often considered male domains. But change is coming, slowly but steadily. Pressing ahead, making yourself heard, pulling each other up, and making a lasting impact on your world, that is what we must do for the benefit of all. We need to celebrate the incredible achievements of women in science, technology, and innovation, and galvanize the global community to do more to ensure that women's participation in the formal sector is the rule, not just the exception. In the informal sector, where women's ingenuity is already the rule, we must be awarded commensurate recognition and support. The International Day for Women in Science is an annual reminder of these opportunities and obligations, holding us accountable for advancing women in science, technology and innovation to achieve, ge to achieve gender equality and by extension, our broader development goals. This ambition is complex and deep, but it starts at the most basic level in the education of children. Parents and teachers, community leaders, influence how young women choose their career path. That choice begins early at school and continues all the way through high education. When science is rejected as a career choice, it is often due to limited information and the dearth of positive role models to encourage young girls to participate. We all know that the family unit is the most influential factor, so parents must be brought in early so that they can learn of opportunities for their children. To many rural and poor parents, these are not only beyond their exposure, but also beyond their imagination. Ladies and gentlemen, my own path to a career in science and leadership started with my parents. While my journey, personal journey, is one of many, I'm reminded of Mark Twain who said, it is better to have second-hand diamonds than none at all. My journey began as an only daughter and I have a younger brother. My father, who was a school teacher, believed in equal opportunity for boys and girls. Importantly, from an early age, I was allowed to make choices for myself. The significance of this, of course, is that I also had to suffer the consequences of those choices. At school, I was blessed with motivated teachers who encouraged me to discover the beauty of the natural world, helping to demystify it by answering the endless question that occurred to a curious 12-year-old. To, to an aware child, a positive response to the classic question is, why is the sky blue? Why are some plants yellow while most remain green? Is a portal into the inner world of the mind. It may be of no coincidence that my teachers were women, or lady teachers as they were called, having attended a Catholic convent school. These religious and lay role models reinforced my interests and strengthened my fascination 
with science. So when relatives asked, urged me to seek the advice of a career guidance counselor, I did. We are in 1978. Men had already walked on the moon nine years before. The world's first test tube baby, Louise Brown, was born that very year. The transformation that science could bring to human lives was real. It was tangible and it was mind-blowing. Yet, despite my advantageous starting point, surrounded by enlightened parents and engaged teachers, the counselor discouraged me from studying science. The reasons cited were as short-sighted as they were disappointing. I was female and science is not for me. And I would return to Mauritius after my studies and there would be new job opportunities for me. I think you must have guessed by now that I'm a pretty stubborn young woman, or younger then. <laughs> so maybe it was this lukewarm approach that helped to galvanize my determination. In the event shortly thereafter, I returned home from school and announced to my father that I was going to follow my heart and study chemistry, and I never looked back. I pursued my higher education in chemistry in the UK. After earning my undergraduate degree, I took what turned out to be a valuable year to get hands-on experience and learn the ropes in industry before earning a scholarship for my PhD. I turned down the opportunity to do a postdoc in the United States, instead returning home, where I later became the first professor of chemistry at the University of Mauritius in 2001. <laughs> a decade later, I took a risky leap into the world of entrepreneurship and established the CIDP, Research and Innovation. After this, I was elected president in 2015, where I have been using my bully pulpit to advance STEM and enhancing the role of science, technology, and innovation in national development plans. Since launching my career, things have changed for the better in Mauritius and in many parts of Africa. But while we have improved access to education, we need all the firepower at our disposal to tackle global challenges, climate change, food and water security and health challenges, to name some of the biggest ones. <coughs> so since, la launch, since launching my career, things have, have improved also in many parts of Africa. But while we have improved access to education, we need all the, all the firepower to tackle these global challenges. So facing these ex existential threats, we must realize that it is not just a moral issue to educate our girls. Gender equality is critical for the economic well-being of both men and women. We must bring all our human resources to bear on these huge challenges. And as Arancha Gonzalez, the executive director of the International Trade Center has said, when women participate in the economy, growth is stronger and it is inclusive. We know based on the wealth of research and experience that empowering women is a necessary and critical economic game changer for any country. And studies reveal, for example, that if women were to participate in the labor force to the same extent as men, national income would increase by 5% in the US, 9% in Japan, and 27% in India. I would be remiss here if I did not pay tribute to late Wangari Matai, scientist, and the very first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize for having raised our consciousness about environmental protection. She drew on her observation from the point of view of a child and fought what she believed in to protect and safeguard the forest in her native Kenya. I'm confident that with the right kind of support, more Wangari Matai will emerge to tackle Africa's development challenges. Undeniably, government has a key role to play in promoting the position of women in the labor market. Affordable childcare, parental leave, workplace flexibility, all critical tools to equal opportunity. Equal pay and better opportunities for women to promote diversity, reduce inequality, boost economic growth for everyone. In Africa, it is a little known fact that women play a critical role in growing food to feed the continent. Women must be empowered with knowledge, technology, financial resources and land, increasing women's access to finance mechanism and removing the legal barriers that still exist in many countries are among the ways to make sure that women can stay in the workforce and achieve their fullest potential. 
In the fast-paced world of scientific research in particular, any long period away from the lab threatens the ability to be creative, publish, and be regarded by colleagues as a productive asset. Fortunately, many countries are recognizing the need for gender equality. The G20 nations representing 85% of the world's GDP and two-thirds of its population have pledged to reduce the gap in labor force participation rates between men and women by 25% by 2025 and to create over 100 million more jobs contributing to economic opportunity and well-being for all. As admirable as this goal may be, the sobering fact is that at this rate, it would take over 150 years to achieve full economic gender equality. Are we prepared to wait this long? Certainly not. So our generation of women and our daughters has the opportunity and the power to bend the arc of history towards greater gender equality and more inclusive global growth. It is a moral and economic imperative that we bring our collective weight to bear to achieve this future much sooner than a century and a half from now. Women can sustain the momentum by voting with our time, our wallets, our social media accounts. We should be able to run our homes as well as run for office, persevere and climb the corporate ladder and become successful entrepreneurs. In doing so, we can show the way for younger women who are following us. And as Madeleine Albright had said, and I shall quote, there is a special place in hell for those women who do not help other women. <laughs> Therefore, it is our sacred and privileged duty as successful women to create the next generation of women leaders. We must hire more women, invest in them, and promote civility among us. Much remains to be done to achieve gender equality, but as an eternal optimist, I'm confident that it will be done because it must be done. One of the great gifts of leadership is the opportunity to work every day with and for the next generation, leading by example, learning from their insights and sharing ideas to keep the momentum going. Only in this way will we ensure that equal work and equal pay become a global reality and that women's rights must be fully respected. After all, women's rights are civil rights and civil rights are human rights. Let us get to work now. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, I'm not sure what more needs to be said at this point. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I will, I'll, I'll start off with the, maybe sort of the hardest question of what is holding us back from equality. You've talked a bit about education levels. You've talked a bit about policies, supporting other women. Um, you know, as a woman coming up in sort of the science sector, you talked about your guidance counselor, but what do you think it's holding us back? When we talk about it in the US in the private sector in Silicon Valley, we talk often about just the workplace culture. When we talk about another context, we talk about sort of the lack of qualified or educated people that are interested. And then we also go in the public sphere to policies. I know Mauritius itself has a law since 2012, right, saying one third of political candidates. What is holding us back, do you think? <clears throat> Thank you, Gwen, for this question. Uh, again, I will go back to my own experience. It's been possible for me uh, to make it uh, to this level on a very, very simple premise. I had house help. I had parent support to look after the family when I was out there. Because as I just mentioned, if you're in the sciences and if you take time off, you never get back. You never get back, you can't be productive because you are on a treadmill and you have to keep on moving. So getting this very basic support <coughs> as house help can be transformational for a woman's career. I, I have benefited for this. I'm very grateful to my parents uh, for having been there to give me support. And I think also uh, finding uh, the, the, the partner, I suppose, and um, the partner helps. Uh, perhaps in my case, uh, he has helped by being indifferent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the benefit of that. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Uh, so at the six, the, there's the, the what they have the messaging is that uh, for young girls who want to make it, marry a doctor because they never home. 
<laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> that is wonderful, actually. I was actually going to ask that, leading to a question of what, um, you know, another strain of this dialogue, you know, sort of what is the role of men in this, right? We talk about women helping each other, and we talk about being tenacious and having household. Um, <coughs> what is the role of men? You know, there is one thing as well that we have, I think this is always again backed up by data and statistics, that the damage is done to a girl child when she is six. That she's told that she can't uh, uh, become a scientist because this is reserved for the boys, they can't become engineers. And I think this is the stereotype that we have to break at mm -hmm. a very early age. And I think if we have uh, the father and the brother telling her from the very young age that she can do anything, I think this will be a game changer. And uh, she has to be given that self-confidence to be able to, to, to move from six onwards. Absolutely. To be so engaged and have that To be that engaged conversation. and have the conversation, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, how are we going to get, are we going to get to the SDGs? We have to look at the SDGs because if we are successful in the 17 SDGs, uh, the world will be a different place, will be a better place. But what we have again to highlight to government uh, is that the SDGs, the rest on a solid foundation of science, technology and innovation. If we want to address food security, hidden hunger, access to water, clean energy, you name it, it's all, it's all engraved in, in the SDGs. So we have to make it, but we have to make our young people tech savvy, science savvy, so that they can, they can embrace all the technologies and of course work towards the SDGs. We were talking about this before, and I, you, you talked a lot in your speech about the importance of science in, in driving, achieving the SDGs and driving creativity um, and so forth. What is the, the importance of, of that in um, new careers and driving, you know, in Africa there's a bulging youth population. Can we talk a bit about the role of science and what younger Africans can look for in terms of job opportunities and sectors? Um, we talk about the youth dividend on the continent. It's, uh, it's, a pos it's a huge boon, but provided we marshal it properly. And uh, it can become a double-edged sword if we do not create the necessary environment for that to, for that to thrive. And I think this is um, the language, the narrative that we have to, to bring forward is that uh, uh, the youth dividend will be a huge asset to the continent Providing we empower them, we empower them with the right training, quality training, science, technology, entrepreneurship, so that they become job creators as opposed to job seekers. Because if you look at World Bank data, uh, I think uh, a couple of years ago, it showed that uh, each year the African continent will be getting something like 11 million graduates reaching the job market per year. And there's no way any government will be able to, you know, provide this many million jobs. So with the power of technology and with what's happening in that, in that space, I think uh, when the youth is uh, empowered, I think that can be a transformation uh, in, in, in terms of job and creation, opportunities of creation as well on the continent. Absolutely, which leads to a, <coughs> a different question that's related to so the role of the diaspora. A lot of youth will leave and go find the jobs elsewhere. There's a lot of people off the continent living in other places. What role can they play and specifically the sort of the, the employment, the job creation, and driving innovation in Africa? The diaspora present a huge reservoir of talent, a huge reservoir of uh, you know, brain power, and uh, you know, you mentioned the, the issue of mobility. We can't prevent people moving uh, because uh, you know, things are what they are, people will tend to move. But I think what we have the responsibility to do is to create the necessary environment and so that these brain will, we will promote brain circulation because I'm not uh, going to say we need brain gain, but if we have brain circulation, but you know, countries, several countries have done this and they have been quite successful in doing so. We've had, for example, the example of China. Uh, they build the ecosystem in such a way that it was much more attractive for the Chinese, for the bright Chinese uh, to come back to China. India has done the same thing. They have created the ecosystem and this is where we need to invest. We need to invest in the ecosystem so that we can bring, I mean, why would a trained, highly talented uh, doctor in Chicago, for example, go back to an African country where the, the ecosystem is on there, tools on there to for, for the equipment the there, to work. Right. So it's our responsibility to invest in that space and it's our responsibility to put in this amount for training our own people. So if you want to make progress in that space, we need to put our hands in our own pocket. 
And how is this going in Mauritius? I mean, what is, what's the word for the youth today? There's opportunities in Mauritius. There's opportunities around climate and biodiversity, STEM education, you quoted the World Economic Forum. How is it going in Mauritius for the youth today, from your perspective, of course? Uh, Mauritius presents a very good example because when we uh, got independence in 1968, again, just to flag in uh, some statistics, uh, the per capita income was about $200. And uh, right now, we have moved up in the upper middle income uh, country uh, status. Now, there are a few decisions that were taken right from the very early on in the, 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 the founding parties, if I may say, of Mauritius, was that we managed to bring in free health care. We brought in social security net for those who are vulnerable. But again, while these are very important, uh, important decisions, I think the game changer came in 1976 when education became free for all. Education. And when the parent knows that uh, he doesn't have, he's a mother, the parent doesn't have, they don't have to choose between educating a boy or a girl because you know, uh, economically it made more sense to educate a <coughs> boy. Mm -hmm. But when they found out that they don't have to make that choice, and we saw the economy moving from the 70s when it was 92% sugar in the early 80s when we started going into a small manufacturing sector. And every 10 years, the economy of Mauritius has reinvented itself. And uh, so we have moved now to higher end of technology, using technology, using ICT. And of course, we have a thriving financial sector. So it shows that it is possible to engage in this, but you need to take the right decision, you need to take some bold decision, but more importantly, you, need, you need to invest in your own people. So my last question before I turn it over to the audience, I'm sort of going across the spectrum. So you've talked about change in the household, um, you've talked about family policies, a little bit about government policies. What is the role of the private sector? I mean, you took a leap out there uh, as an entrepreneur, but what is the role of the private sector? And you talked about the youth creating their opportunities. Um, you know, uh, if you look at the education system, especially the higher education system, we need to engage with the private sector so that the training that is being given in universities, they are relevant. Mm -hmm. And this is a conversation that I've been having, uh, you know, at, at many uh, fora uh, on the continent, that we need to embrace the private sector more and more, have a very close relationship so that, if you talk about the youth belt, so that when these kids go there, for example, for training, uh, by the time they graduate, they, they have identified either an employer or they have realized that this job is not for me and I need to do something else. So we need to have this very close link with the private sector uh, to, make, uh, to make the right, uh, what, right training, mm -hmm. uh, right uh, education, right curriculum, yeah. so that it is speaking to the, you know, to, to the needs of the to continent. The needs of yeah. the <coughs> and where do they stand in terms of some of these policy changes, whether it's healthcare, which is free in Mauritius, but not in other places, or whether it's family leave policy, or is that something the government or they need to sort of share the responsibility for creating the ecosystem that will support gender equality? Uh, definitely, I mean, there's also a, a space for philanthropy as well. Um, so if we look at this magic triangle of public sector, private sector, philanthropy, I think we have a, a good recipe for, for more progress on the continent. And again, this is something that we have to, to, to upload in the US. We had the, the mm -hmm. culture of philanthropy and many Asian countries have the culture of philanthropy. We've seen the, the, the positive uh, benefits from it. So again, this is something that uh, I'm also giving my voice uh, to that. And this is one of the reasons why I'm in the US with the, uh, with the Grand Challenge meeting, where we're going to address CARI, which is the Coalition for Africa Research Innovation, using the power of philanthropy and public institutions, I was looking at the private sector, uh, to see to it that uh, you create that ecosystem uh, to attract the talent, yes. It's not only driving innovation, it's driving the, the sort of race to the SDGs, right? Yes. With the goalkeepers yes. and other such initiatives. So we're gonna turn it over to the audience. I think we've given a broad, broad spectrum from a leadership, education, STEM, um, a lot on, on sort of innovation. I really like the link between science specifically, being able to drive innovation across sectors and across a country. So I welcome your questions. Um, if you could please identify yourself. If you could also keep your questions short and with an inflection or a question mark at the end, that would be incredibly helpful um, because we'd like to get to as many as possible and we'd like to give Madam President the chance to be able to respond. So we'll start up here with the woman in the yellow. And they will bring the microphones down to you. So if you can please wait until the microphone, because we are webcasting this. So we'd like the audience to hear. Hi, Excellency, Madam President, Ms. Gwen, Dr. 
<laughs> thank you so much for welcome and thank you so much for this wonderful presentation on STEM. My company is called Segeros International Group. I'm the president uh, and uh, I focus on manufacturing and um, uh, supply chain. How, looking at STEM, why are there not many women doing manufacturing? They just do small, simple jobs as much as they are in STEM. W how can we encourage manufacturing of women, young women in Africa and other countries? Looking at what you just explained, what's the problem? So you have the answer. Thank you so much. And uh, we want to encourage more and more and more women and girls in manufacturing because that's the cross of uh, uh, countries doing manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. So women manufacturing the link with STEM and encouraging that job creation. Um, well, first of all, I think the numbers, we have seen the numbers, which are, of course, not speaking to a uh, big participation of women in that space. So there is a lot of work to do to actually bring more women in. But those countries and those sectors that have encouraged manufacturing, they are the ones that can create jobs. And I think through the manufacturing, you can also bring in innovation and how to improve on that product as well. So these two, I think these two are linked so that when you have manufacturing, you can have the potential for innovation, but you need the resources to be backed up. And if we get women, if we get well, men and women as well to, to, to do this, but where we are missing out is that we are leaving out 52% of that potential workforce, that, you know, that intuitive capacity that women bring uh, in, into the space so as to be able to be more creative. And, uh, but we need uh, women also, uh, well, in the manufacturing as uh, workers to be able to, to develop more innovative products. But more importantly, we need women to be actually you know, creators of that, uh, of that company. And uh, this is, again, the, 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 the conversation that we need to see what is preventing these women to getting access to finance, to getting access to, you know, to, to land. And uh, all these, uh, the, the ecosystem has to be re-looked into so that the women can get access to all these and become much more creative and become uh, employers. I mean, this is what I did as well when I, was, when I moved from the university, uh, finding uh, a space, uh, finding um, the, the mechanism and of course the uh, finances to translate my research because what I did was that I translated my academic research into a business, uh, her herbal medicine to developing innovative ingredients. It may be, it looks very nice now, it looks very sexy to say that you can do it, but when you are there, it's not easy, I can tell you that, because we have all the negatives on your side. <laughs> but yeah. stay there. I think it's one of the things too in manufacturing perhaps is a bit like agriculture in showing what the opportunities are and making that a profession that people actually think that they would want to go into. Because if you're facing challenges of access to finance, so I wonder if it's a bit about that. What are the job opportunities? Where can you go? You know, you mentioned a very important area, which is agriculture. 60% of the world's arable land is in Africa. Uh, but right now, uh, we know that uh, Africa didn't benefit from the Green Revolution. It kind of, m we missed it. Uh, but uh, the issue that we have to raise is that uh, Africa agriculture is mostly rain-fed. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, as we speak about climate change, we're witnessing that uh, any change in the weather pattern, crops are not thriving, of course, addressing food security. Uh, we're not even mentioning uh, hidden hunger mm. has been the other issue and uh, there's already one country uh, right now that is getting really the brunt of uh, agriculture in, you know, the, the waste and, and of course uh, Madagascar for example I have in mind right now and uh, we're already seeing the impact that this will have on children who are not fully nourished properly and uh, what this will have in terms of the next generation. So we're already compromising the next generation. How now, how women, uh, again, let me be very, very frank, women feed Africa. Mm -hmm. But how do we empower these women to produce more? How, what tools do we put at the disposal? What are the, the mechanisms, land, access to finances, bank, you name it, all these issues are there. So we need to have this conversation with leaders to see to it that we need to bring many more women as entrepreneurs in the space of agriculture. But having said this, there is also the, the, the 
image that we give to agriculture, which, uh, which of course prevent young people going, going there. If we're going to portray African agriculture as the woman with a baby on her back and a hoe yep. in the, hard <laughs> su in the sun, it is not going to be attractive. But, so this is again something, this is where science comes in, technology comes in, and the communication of uh, the potential that agriculture has in solving a lot of the problems on the continent. Food security, Absolutely. job creation, you name it, so it's all there. Defining it as a profession. Absolutely. Yeah. Do we have the lady in the red down here? And then we will come over here and go in the back. Madame la Présidente, je suis de votre pays. I've left some 50 years ago back home. And today I flew from Florida for me to bring you my congratulations. As you can <laughs> I waited for this time a long time ago. As you can hear from my voice, you left me very emotional. Back home 50 years ago, I never had an education. I was a girl growing up, but I ran away. So today I'm happy to say that I got my education at UF, University of Florida, before that spending 20 years in Africa. Listening to you today, I'll make it short and sweet because you've answered everything I had to ask you. <laughs> That's for sure. I am confident that you're going to bring our young girls, like, like we say affectionately, mm -hmm, our women back home in leadership roles. I can see it, I heard it, you've said it all. I'm confident that you can do that. But one thing I'm going to ask you, there are so many opportunities for women to come and pursue their studies. Also, they're getting good education in Mauritius. You've got, a, you've got an excellent university back home, if I may say back home. And I do thank you for that, and I do congratulate you for that. So will there be more opportunities for young women to come overseas and to get more education? especially in agriculture, that is my, in my call. But again, I have to thank you. Thank you. Should we? Maybe should we take two or three oh, questions? Yeah. yeah, let's come down here. Yes. Uh, Alyssa, there's a woman right here. And then we will go, <laughs> you back there, right? We will go in the back. We've got the selfie stick. Bonjour, Madame la Présidente, journaliste de Dutek Lengule, Afrique, One Africa Television, États-Unis. Uh, it was really a pleasure for me to be here. I was so impressed by your background. And I think, as I said it to Excellency Ellen Johnson last week, you are part of the women that <coughs> empower us, young women from Africa, to think that we can achieve such level. My question is, when I look at back home in Africa for a whole, I'm a journalist and I have a lot of African people following me on the social media. The young girls, they are so inspired with the good idea, but they are lack of financial. The suffering to get financial. When I see the program 2065 from United, uh, Africa, United, uh, African Union, it sounds so good, but until now, we are not feeling like those women are getting those financial. Myself, I went close to the ex Excellency Embassy here from African Union. I give her my project. I never even have a reply, reply that they receive it. So what could we do as African women to really get involved into this financial support? Because we have idea, we are ready to work for our continent. Here in the diaspora and back home, everybody is giving those good speech everywhere. Believe me, I'm on all the corner from African community. I'm there in New York here. Everybody comes, say good things. But when times come in practice, we are not feeling it really. They are doing it, I don't say no, but it's really low because we're still receiving complaint and complaint and complaint. And most of the time, women, like you recognize it, 
we have a difficulty to receive financial. And uh, I'm going to end to saying that uh, next month I'm going to uh, uh, South Africa for Africa, uh, African Women Entrepreneur. We're going to put that problem on the table again. What could African women do to really be more support financially? Because we have idea, we have education, we, have, we can do a lot of stuff, but no bank want to borrow us money in Africa. Nobody want to support the project. And like you say, I was happy to say that, uh, to hear that women most of the time do not want to support women. What could we do, Excellency, for your advice? Thank you. Thank you. We will take the one more question, sorry to keep you running in the back up there, and we have a microphone. So access to finance and how women can support each other and different banking and financial arrangements. Yes, madam. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you for coming. I've had the opportunity to visit Port Louis. My name is Eve Ferguson. I'm reference librarian for East Africa. And I wanted to ask about the financial sector in Mauritius because Mauritius is uh, considered one of the more financially successful um, African countries. And uh, typically, not only in Africa, but also in the West, we see that uh, women are excluded from the finance and banking industries. Uh, it's usually an old boys club. And I wanted to ask about what efforts are made in Mauritius to get the women into the position to be able to uh, pass on the finances or assist financially um, from a banking and finance industry perspective towards women's uh, work. Thank you. And I, before you start to answer the three questions, I think what's interesting too is that you uh, were on the board of Barclays Bank of Mauritius, if I'm correct, but women ministers across the globe, um, only 38% of, of them are in ministries other than education, health, sort of the social, cultural ministry. So I think that question of where women are in government just as much as sort of the private sector. So <laughs> I'll just quickly <laughs> react to the last question. Um, in terms of, uh, I think I understood correctly that uh, it's about representation of women in the financial uh, sectors in Mauritius, whether we have more men than women. Is that right? I, I don't think this is, uh, no, uh, this is, uh, these are not figures which we have in terms of uh, the financial sector for employment of women in, in, that, in that sector. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's there. We, we have uh, issues, for example, let's say women in politics, where there is not a very good representation of women in politics. Uh, but uh, in many sectors, we don't have this gender kind of bias. In fact, some of the, we have really engendered, for example, the uh, legal, uh, we have many women judges and magistrates and the legal structure. We have many women doctors. In the education sector, there are many women. So I don't think this, uh, this figure apply really to the financial sector in terms of access to jobs. Uh, they, they take on the best. Uh, and uh, you have said, uh, for example, uh, Barclays Bank, uh, yes, uh, they, they do. But you know, in many of these, uh, of these, um, of these sectors, there is an excuse that uh, we don't have sufficient women talented. But I think what we have to do is establish a register. And this is something which is happening in many countries uh, where there is a register, so there is no, uh, there's no issue that you, know, that you don't have find good women. There are women, but we need to, uh, to work so as to make them more visible. And I think this is something that, that has to be done uh, so that uh, there's no companies, no institution have the excuse to say that you know, we did not find the right women. And to come to the two question of agriculture and to access to finance, you know, this issue is there all the time. Who actually is going to invest? Who is going to invest on us? It boils down to our government. The government have to train their own people. They have to take decision. And again, if we look back, if we go up again in the overarching, uh, you know, power all that we have. We have the power to vote. We have to take our governments accountable. We have to ask for, for, for you know, explanation as to why this is not the case. And this is something that, uh, you know, people are always telling me, oh, the politicians are not doing this, that, and the other. I said, the power is with you. The power is with us. Each vote counts. So we need to take, and this is something that we have to keep on asking in, on the continent accountability. We can no longer go and say uh, it boiled down to the colonial powers. You're okay. They've been there 
but it's been 50 years since I left. So we have to do something about this, and it's down to us. We have to fund our people, we have to fund our institutions, we have to invest in education of our people. I mean, when we took that decision in 1976, people said the country will go bankrupt. And Joe Stiglitz came to Mauritius a few years ago, and he wrote an op-ed. And uh, in fact, I met him a couple of weeks ago, and he said that uh, he wrote that op-ed. Uh, he got, of course, vilified by some people. So how can you write something like this? Because he said that Mauritius must be super rich because we give free education and free health care. Uh, so it's not possible, you know, because we don't have any mineral resources. So this is something, this is a conversation we need to keep on asking. How much are we investing in our people? The issue that aid and trade, all these things, okay, aid, I keep on saying, it's seed money. But what we build on this afterwards, how much do we invest? So it's the way we vote, it's the way we appoint our people. Ask questions, we'll get the answers. So I don't may have straight answers to this, but I can only go back to where I come from. The reason why I'm here sitting in front of you is because somebody took that decision in 1976. But more importantly, at a personal level, I had a father who believed in education, in e the educating, in educating his boy and girl equally. So it boils down to basic home values and to the parents, what we want to do. I will have no qualms educating my boy, giving my boy and my, my girl the same chances. So it boils down to this. Each individual, we are all accountable, we are responsible for the decision we take. I want to ask a different question on the follow-up, so it's threading the two. You've talked, a bit of, you've talked about transparency, you've talked about accountability, and we've talked a bit about the numbers. So how important is it to have that data of like where, where people are in the government, where they are in the financial sector, how the country's doing? How is that helpful for advocacy purposes or driving change? <coughs> Again, you know, Gwen, this is a thing that I've been, you know, really uh, pushing for, credible data. Credible data come with credible institutions and credible institutions come with credible people we take on board. So then we'll get good data, then we'll shape our policy. So again, like uh, President Obama had said, Africa need strong institutions not strong men or women. So we get what we put, put in. <laughs> we get out what we put in. Okay, so we'll we need on. to do that, <laughs> yes. We'll start with the, the two individuals down here and then we'll sort of move back. The gentleman here in the end, please. Uh, my name is Mohammed Saeed. Uh, my question uh, to her, Your Excellency, uh, why you decided to run for the office to be a president of Mauritius? <laughs> I was hoping someone would ask that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, especially you are from a very different uh, sector of business. Uh, this is my question. Thank oh, you. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. And uh, here you speak about such a critical subject. My name is Selina. I'm from Mauritius. And I studied law and environmental policy in France and here in DC and focusing on climate change. I'm under often under the impression that the youth in Mauritius is not involved enough in issues of climate change, uh, adaptation and mitigation, and I think there's a lack of environmental, strong environmental education in the public sector in Mauritius. I want to know what the government is doing to uh, increase sensitivity in climate change issues um, and environmental uh, degradation, and because I think if uh, we could increase awareness, more women and more people, more young people want to be involved academically and professionally in that subject, and it would bridge the gap that we have uh, in in um, in terms of um, um, data and um, you know and um, good uh, s um, academic study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a nice pairing of questions. Maybe, yes, maybe sure. the two are linked. The two are linked exactly. Um, I'll probably quickly react to the climate change. Um, I think you must come back again and revisit. <laughs> You'll find that quite a bit is being done uh, on this space. And uh, uh, I, I think you've listened to, uh, the we have, you have seen the document we submitted at COP21 in terms of the INDC and the NDC. And one of the key points I can remember is that 30% of the energy resources, for example, would come from renewable energy. Uh, there's a lot being done, but again, climate change is something that uh, we have to act uh, nationally, but there has to be this solidarity internationally, because there are certain things that will be beyond us. I mean, for example, warming of the oceans, 
and we have seen recently what the warm oceans mean in terms of disaster, uh, acidification of the ocean, impact on coral reef. Uh, but what we have to do is change the way we do things. And we have to be, each, again, it comes down to each individual. What are we doing at, at our level uh, to see to it that our action, we ensure sustainability in terms of our consumption pattern, for example. Uh, so these are challenges that we, we, we need to address, but there has to be this global solidarity. But I can assure you that at national level, uh, we, are, we are really tackling climate change, especially in terms of adaptation, because we, we can't talk about mitigation. We did not pollute but we have to adapt uh, in, the, in the wake of all the, all the problems that we have. Now, why did I run for office? Uh, well, I can summarize it by saying I'm, I'm an accidental president. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I didn't choose uh, this world, the world chose me. And uh, so when my name was flagged uh, during the campaign, I said to the journalist who was interviewing me, I said, ma'am, I think you missed the, the person. I'm not the person, I don't have any ambition. So she says to me, why don't you say this in an interview? So I did give her an interview. And what did I see the next day on the newspaper? My name, my picture, for president, small interrogation mark. People didn't see the interrogation mark. They just saw my name as president. It acted as a sounding board. And people said, why not? <laughs> I love so it. So there I am. <laughs> and you said why not, which is also yes. equally as important. <laughs> equally as important. I think let's start with the gentleman here, and then we'll move to the middle. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Peter Matlin, uh, Cornell University, and Your Excellency, thank you very, very much for providing such an inspiring example um, and uh, the way you've pursued your career and your current uh, passions. And thanks also to your parents for providing <laughs> you that initial <laughs> enabling uh, launching platform uh, when you were a child. I'm happy that you put some emphasis on the importance of agriculture as one of the sectors where science-led innovation can make significant impact uh, for broad development. Uh, some nine years ago, uh, there was a program that was launched by a number of uh, African institutions in East Africa with support from the Rockefeller Foundation, subsequently uh, supported by Gates, by USAID, by Agropolis in France, and by a range of, of, of corporate uh, entities, both in Africa and in, in the West. And it's, it's called AWARD, mm -hmm. African Women in Agricultural mm -hmm. Research and Development. And it was launched with an initial working hypothesis that uh, the initial problem was to focus on outstanding women and to turbocharge their careers with mentorship programs, with training in leadership and management, with uh, training in advanced science. That program has now gone through seven cohorts. Uh, there are some seven, 800 women who have served as fellows for a two-year fellowship, and thousands more that have been impacted through ripple effects. What has been found in the fairly intensive evaluation is that while that program has succeeded in transforming individual lives, when they've returned to their work, they go back into an often hostile work environment in their institutions mm -hmm. where policies, procedures, cultures do not encourage their continued career development and a set of constraints at the national level that don't encourage them to stay in science and to merge as leaders in their sectors and their institutions. You have succeeded in, in Mauritius. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know um, how you have um, addressed those problems at the individual level, at the institutional level, and at the policy level that has enabled so many women to enter and stay involved and emerge as leaders in, in, in science sectors in your country. And again, thank you so much for your example. It's really inspiring. Wonderful. Thank you. Are you going to take that before? You take that or you want to take more? Yeah, why don't I take a couple more? We're going to yeah. go with the, mm -hmm. the woman in the yellow. We sort of have a yellow in the middle, so. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Yasin Choi. I'm from the Gambia, and I go to school at Georgetown University studying international politics and my certificate in African studies. Um, it's not every day that you get to see a female African president, and this is my first time getting to see one in person. <laughs> <laughs> and today being my birthday, it could not have been a better day to see one in Happy person. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, 
as a young um, African woman aspiring to be a politician, um, go back home and uh, join the political field, I would like to hear some advice from you. Um, it will be a great honor to hear what you would have to say to a young African woman who would want to be a politician. Thank you. This is fantastic. It goes from <laughs> going back into the culture and then leading with the, the call to charge, right? Well, to be honest with you, I don't know whether I can give you advice on how to become a politician. Uh, but I think uh, that uh, if you engage in that space, I think uh, tie your vision to goals as to what you want to do. Because unfortunately, there is a lot of short-termism in, in this space uh, when you are trying to become a politician. Uh, so if you really want to make it, I mean, if you take, for example, I mean, Wangari Matai, uh, what she did, and uh, she had a vision, and uh, she's left behind a legacy. So I think we have to work towards this. We need more women in politics, there's no doubt about this. But what you do when you are in that space, that will matter more at the end. And what legacy do you leave behind? So th start thinking about it, engage, but engage <coughs> for the betterment of that society you are going to, to be in. And uh, there are challenges everywhere. Uh, but like myself, I'm in this space and I have given myself the task of promoting science uh, because this is what I know best of how to do and uh, try to get uh, to use that space, as I say, I have a bully pulpit to advocate for science and uh, to ensure that the funding goes in and this will probably uh, answer a little bit of a question there uh, from our colleague in, in Cornell. Um, how do you uh, engage or with institutions and what do you do when you're there? I mean, this is, we will not be able to change the world in overnight, but I think if we leave something behind and uh, this is perhaps more important. So it, de it depends on the vision you have for, the, for that post. Uh, to come back to the award program, yes, uh, Professor, it is a very, very important and, uh, uh, program, and I'm aware of this, and I know uh, uh, many areas that have been touched by this program, but you're right. When women go back uh, to their countries, this is again where we need to build our institution to recognize the, the needs. Now, if any country had a blueprint of development, like for example in Mauritius we have Agenda well, Vision 2030. You need to have that, that vision where you're going uh, for the development of, of, of a country. If country, each country does the SWOT test, we know the strengths, we know the weaknesses, we know where we want to go. For example, I can safely say for my country, we need to go into three areas. Uh, in terms of development, we need to have the blue economy, we need to have the green economy, we need to have the white economy. The white economy will embrace all the services, and of course there are a lot of interaction between, uh, among the, the three sectors. And if a country had a vision of saying, we want to develop agriculture as a pillar of development. So these women, if there was vision, they would grow in. But we need also to have the enabling policies. We need to have the enabling environment, like uh, you know, whether she have access to land, uh, deeds, uh, access to bank. In Mauritius, we have uh, the, a, a bank, the development bank, which is now giving uh, a lot of uh, funding to, to these entrepreneurs who are actually on board. And I think in Mauritius, we have 50% of the workforce already in the small and medium enterprises. Because this is, this is a sector that we need to look into, because this is transformational. We've seen, for example, what SMEs have done in Italy, for example. Uh, family businesses which have merged, but having this overarching structure uh, to ensure that we know we actually leverage whatever we can, diaspora, funding, access, and really look at the ecosystem so that this woman uh, can actually flourish in whatever space she, she is in. And to come back to the this question of agriculture we had from our Mauritian friend here, it's, you know, we need to do this what? We need to, to look at the institutions, we need, but of course the challenges are there. Uh, unfortunately, in many countries, uh, women are still marginalized. They still do not have, uh, they still do not have the rights uh, in, in the same way as uh, they should, you know, in terms of uh, access to all this. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge task. We need to start thinking about it. But you're right, the talent have to be marshaled in these areas so that we can really make a difference. But again, my, my mantra or my rhetoric, whatever you can say, is that we need to invest in our own people. We can no longer keep on saying that Africa is not moving because we are not getting the right aid. We need to invest in our own people. And this comes with commitment from government. And those governments who don't commit, you have the vote. Use it. So.
what an inspirational discussion about leadership and the ecosystem. What I liked, what you talked about, is investing in the people, mm -hmm. but the vision and goals and the innovation. You know, how are we driving that? And how is that going to drive all pieces of this ecosystem from starting at home to what you're talking about, what your family's talking about, the support system you need, to the policies sort of up at the government level? So Your Excellency Amina Group, I think thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for using our bully pulpit <laughs> to talk about leadership and investing with people, and we thank are you. honored. And can we all say thank you and stay seated while the President leaves. <laughs>